We're, we're going away from this strictly masculine way of looking at things and leadership specifically that the wave has to be highest, the highest wave, the biggest building, the biggest what, whatever it is. And we're going, hey, good leader must be like Tao, must lie below. And so we must follow behind the people. Do you see what I'm saying here? It's not like, because a lot of people will say that everybody should like, you know, buy a hundred acres and all your problems will be solved. And to that I say, you cannot run away from your own legs, okay? We suddenly separate it from the greater body. We get lost, we grow our ego, we fuel it, and suddenly we're a drop of water that thinks it's the ocean itself. We're th we think we're a separate ocean. Welcome back to this series on the Tao Te Ching, where we're going over each meditation of Taoism's most important text. So like always, if you're new here, I recommend going to my channel where I have all these videos in a playlist, up to date, and in order for you to watch. So without further delay, reading from the Jafu Feng and Jain English translation of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. Here is chapter 66. Why is the sea king of a hundred streams? Because it lies below them. Therefore, it is the king of a hundred streams. If you would guide the people, you must serve with humility. If you would lead them, you must follow behind. In this way, when you rule, the people will not be harmed. The whole world will support you and will not tire of you. Because you do not compete, you will not have competition. So in this first part here, why is the sea king of a hundred streams? Because it lies below them. Therefore, it is the king of a hundred streams. There is a line in the Quran, Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rejun. And the only reason I know that is because it is probably my favorite, one of my favorite lines in the Quran. And it means, to paraphrase, from God we come, to God we shall return. And that is true for everyone. Now, I bring that up because every single bit of water on this planet, because first we have to understand this and then I'll get to the bigger picture. So every single bit of water, waves, rain, clouds, ocean, rivers, streams, whatever it is, it's all part of the same body of water, so more or less. It is all water, technically speaking. It is all part of this extremely complex system of oceans, streams, precipitation, weather cycles, seasons, and it's so harmonious and one could say it's also so so chaotic it looks so chaotic you have hurricanes and streams and everything right and it's not a coincidence that this is like this beginning of this chapter is about the sea king 100 streams as we are talking about water again water being the perfect example but that's not the only point here so like i said all these things right these things that we put labels on rain waves this and that it's all water. It all is water. And you think about a stream, right? Now, also, the, the language is important to understand here. The way I see it, 100 streams is referring to the many streams, right? Similar to how we say the 10,000 things to um, kind of encapsulate all the labels and things that we have in the physical world. The 10,000 things, because it's a number not too high, but it's also not too low. So it's like the king of 100 streams, the king of the all the streams, right? The ocean is the king of it because it is the great body of water that all streams flow into. All faiths, all religions are like streams flowing into the same universal truth. All light, all energy comes from the sun, right, on this earth. Like there's so many different ways that you can take this and understand that there is a bigger picture. Now, when we get lost in the illusions, when we get so caught up in whatever worldly things, our religion, our culture, our government, even though these things are man-made and they're not real, we completely lose sight of the bigger picture, that we all flow back into the same ocean, which is why I bring up that line in the Quran, which I think is really beautiful, you know, that from God we came, you know, to God we shall return. This is a fact for every single one of us, but we get so caught up and we believe, you know, this stream is the stream, is the ocean. Similar to how 
one wave in the ocean thinking it is separate from the entire ocean, but it's all part of the same ocean. And this line here that why is the sea king of a hundred streams? Because it lies below them. Now this is another callback, another point made about humility, right? The common theme of lying below. We just talked about the feminine, I believe in, in uh, chapter 61, about how the feminine overcomes the male through stillness and by lying low. This is a common theme throughout this book and it's not a coincidence. But also understand that physically speaking, <laughs> physically speaking, all the streams of the earth are, are above the ocean like literally above the ocean, because that's how gravity works, because, you know, all the water that's coming from whatever, the mountains, precipitation, raining down and, and melted snow is trickling down. But guess what? Just like how when humans die, we all return back to God, like that line says in the Quran, all the streams, they all go into the same ocean. And then through incredible means of, of evaporation and whatever, precipitation, I'm not a weather expert, that same water can trickle back down the same mountain, almost like in another lifetime, so to speak, a lifetime of the water. Anyway, this is a very metaphorical, you know, point that I'm going on with here, but understand that this, if, if you take this and kind of understand that there is a, um, there is a humility to everything, you know, like I said, the energy that comes from the sun, uh, and also, by the way, energy cannot be destroyed, like we talked about in a very early chapter, in one of the first 10 chapters, energy cannot be destroyed. And one of the reasons that energy cannot be destroyed, it can only be transformed and converted, is that it is ultimately part of one body of energy. So then when you have that energy and it manifests itself in a certain physical way, like in a human being, a body-mind consciousness complex we call a human being, or a light bulb, or whatever it is, we suddenly separate it from the greater body, which is of course not real, that's an illusion. It is all part of that same body because if these things were actually separate, you know, if this, if when the stream ends, this like it really ends, then that would be it. But it's the same thing with the light bulb. The light bulb that the energy, the energy is being transformed and it's being converted into heat and light, but the energy itself is not being destroyed. So if this wasn't true, that it was all part of one great body, then the energy that is being consumed, used by the light bulb, would literally be destroyed. And that's not the case, quite frankly, with anything. And so this is proof that everything is interconnected. Everything is part of one body of universal energy. You'll hear a lot of spiritual people, new age people who, who will use these terms of universal energy, the universal whatever. I use these terms as well because it's true. And it's also kind of, it's scientific. And I love this part of the chapter here. It's, it's being used this whole thing with water and with streams, especially because like I said, when the water flows into the ocean, it is eventually, it goes back to where it started on the top of the mountain or wherever the stream is flowing from through these incredible means of, you know, the water gets evaporated and the clouds and they move with the wind and then it rains again on the mountain, you know, but it's kind of like that energy doesn't know, right? Like the energy life force of a human being, the energy that is animating a human being, when it, wherever it goes, it's not going to be within this human context, but it does go somewhere. It has to, because energy cannot be destroyed the same way a life cannot die. Life dying is a contradiction. And quite frankly, you know, this is such a beautiful, beautiful way to talk about God in that it's, it's a much more, you know, comfortable and, um, you know, easier way to approach the topic of, of life and death and the, and the cycles of, of life and energy in a spiritual context that, um, where, where many people may not, you know, they might, may not want to even touch this topic. And the truth is we are drops in the ocean, you know? We are waves in the ocean, like I said, and a lot of us get fooled into thinking that we are separate from the ocean because we are a big wave. We're a big wave in our whatever, maybe our, our 20s or 30s, and we think we're the, you know, in the top of the world, we're like a big wave, but we're, we're part of the same ocean. And guess what? That ocean, uh, that wave, you know, it goes and then it, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the ocean. We get lost, we grow our ego, we fuel it, 
and suddenly we're a drop of water that thinks it's the ocean itself. We're th we think we're a separate ocean. So I think this, this whole point here and how it's being conveyed with humility is really, really, really beautiful. And, it, and you know, it's not to say that there can't be exceptional manifestations of, of God on earth, which there are, you know, because then you could say, but what about prophets? What about Jesus Christ? What about these sages and mystics? It's like, yeah, there are outliers there, but they're extremely very, very few. And by very few, I mean tens of thousands that we may not even know of. But guess what? Even they are still just waves part of the same ocean. <laughs> you know, they are still that same energy. And that's actually a beautiful thing because it's like that same energy that you that is there in Jesus Christ, for example, exists within all of us. That's the entire point. He became a human being. And guess what? We're also human beings. Think about it. Why is the ground the king or the god, so to speak, of all plants and, uh, and animals because it lies below them. It literally allows them to exist and it literally is how they exist. And the same goes for the Tao and all of creation itself. So if you would guide the people, you must serve with humility. If you would lead them, you must follow behind. In this way, when you rule, the people will not be harmed. The whole world will support you and will not tire of you. So it is not a coincidence that this chapter then continues with more advice on leadership. Like I mentioned throughout this series, and you can just see it if you know you, you read this book, this is kind of written in the context for leaders, for the wise, you know, a good leader and for a wise person and the wise this and guiding the people, leading them, ruling. This is not a coincidence. There was an intentional direction for this book when Lao Tzu wrote it, it seems. And beautifully, it is always tied in with humility. It is always tied in with that as the foundation. That needs to be the foundation. Being in touch with primal virtue, primal union, living in primal union, and then ultimately being able to traverse and rule and guide things of the physical world can actually be done in a more proper way. Not in a good and bad way, right? But it's in this more neutral way. You know, in the first chapter I talked about, uh, first or second, or maybe both, I talked about, you know, non-duality and I explained non-duality in the sense that being neutral, and of course non-duality cannot fully be understood as humans, right? Never. It never can. But we can get glimpses of it and maybe achieve some level of neutrality and moderation to where we can have some kind of, you know, benefit from it. But so just to understand that point. But I explained in those early chapters about how using the example of a social worker or a therapist and that a therapist, you know, or, or some kind of social worker needs to kind of always be in a neutral perspective in order to make the best outcome for their client or their patient, whatever it may be. Whereas when if they were to come to the table with their biases and their good and evil, maybe their dualistic outlook, they are more likely to choose something that is not necessarily good for that person. Why? Because we're all individuals, right? So that person needs to be as neutral as possible to take all the information that is being given to them from the client or patient to then make the best suggestions and guidance with what might be best for that person. The same sentiment goes for a leader in approaching things with neutrality and humility. And I just think it's so beautiful in this chapter how it's like, this is really like, this is like taking everything a step further because everything throughout this book has kind of been like, I just think it's getting into a realm of poetry and, and, and just this beautiful approach in that the first part of the chapter, you know, we're talking about how the great wave, you know, or at least I was, but like a stream, you know, it all leads back into the ocean. That great wave is still part of the ocean, this whole thing of humility in everything that we do. That is what we've been told in all these previous chapters about the Tao. Not only that, but words cannot encapsulate the Tao. And this thing, this incomprehensible thing that we can't put a cap on, that is what we go back to. To God we came from, to God we shall return. And then that ultimately being tied in with what it means to be a good leader, I think is what makes this book so exceptional among the big religious texts and philosophical texts of the past few millennia. Because it's really something to think about what Lao Tzu wrote this stuff 
in the time of Conf- Confucianism was rampant and you know the story of he was like I'm I'm out of here guys and then a guard was like hey can you leave us something so he left us the Tao Te Ching like that's the story and really think about how he, he's talking about something that is so personal and so deep to every single person but he doesn't actually tell us to you know back off and and leave society forever even though he did but it's really something that that he puts such an emphasis on leadership and how to guide and rule the people because he really saw that as one of the big problems maybe the biggest problem in that the leadership is what has caused all this disorder and this departure from the Tao, departure from the traditional view of nature being king of the proof being in the pudding so to speak so i don't know i just think it's a really really beautiful thing especially now that we're nearing the end of the book but we know now like we can up to this point you know assuming that you've been following or at least have are familiar or have been meditating on some of the previous stuff the whole everything about duality everything about you know tall creates short good creates bad the essence of why water is the greatest teacher, why nature is the greatest teacher, cultivating primal virtue, practicing Wu Wei. A lot of this stuff is, it, it's not that cryptic anymore. You can actually recognize how beautiful it is. And so with that, you know, we're, we're go- going away from these traditional, and, I, and I, I have to say this every time, but like when I say masculine and feminine, I'm referring to the cosmic masculine and feminine, not necessarily gender roles, but like, we're, we're going away from this strictly masculine way of looking at things and leadership specifically, that the wave has to be highest, the highest wave, the biggest building, the biggest what, whatever it is. And we're going, hey, good leader must be like Tao, must lie below, okay? And also there is no, there is nothing without the ground. There is no stream without the ocean. There is no wave without the ocean. And so we must follow behind the people. The frustration that a lot of people may have with leadership, even back in the day when this was written and even in our current day and age, is when leaders forget about the people that they're ruling over. And so we are told to follow behind the people. And, uh, and you know, it's said here so beautifully that like, why? Why do we have to be behind the people and remain below them? Because the people won't be harmed. I mentioned in a previous chapter about avoiding war and how if you really put the collective ego first and you don't recognize the universality of everything and you don't realize that everything is interconnected and you really have your faith, instead of putting it in God and universal truth, you put it in the illusions of a country, of borders, of you know an ethnicity, whatever it is that you consider you know, the the end all be all, which a lot of people do, sadly, you as a leader might be more than willing to send your young men to die for something that isn't even real. And so this is tied in with what is being said here in that in this way, when you rule, the people will not be harmed, period. If you follow behind the people and you lie below them, it's going to be very hard to do something like that, to commit atrocities and for things to happen in these horrible ways. And of course, on top of all that, the whole world will support you and will not tire of you. We have a lot of countries in this world, major superpowers, and a lot of people are tired of them. (laughs) And a lot of them are not following behind the people. So I'll leave that at that. People get tired of an ego, man. You know, people get tired of that collective ego real quick, especially. And isn't that really something how how it's worded here? Because you know what happens when a collective ego gets big enough inevitably? Like, I'm, I'm not saying in principle. I'm just saying historically speaking, when a collective ego gets big enough, what happens? People get hurt. Something happens. There is a genocide. There is an atrocity. There is a big war. Isn't that something? Even Lao Tzu knew this. You know, he didn't even he didn't even live through any world wars. He knew this. And so to conclude, so because you do not compete, you will not have competition. Now, this is something that you could have a knee jerk reaction to, like I've said, with many things in this book and say, oh, this is like, oh, if you're lazy and you do nothing, then, yeah, obviously you won't have any competition. Like if I just act like the big Lebowski, like a like a hippie on the couch and I just don't do anything. Like, that's not what's being said here. And we know this at this point. This entire philosophy is full of these kind of poetic, wise uh, sayings that sound like contradictions. Act through non-action. 
Be like water. What on earth does that mean? Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. In a book full of words. That's the entire point of this book, flipping logic on its head. Logic has no place in the forefront, okay, in this philosophy. That's kind of the point. It's not a, an equation. It's a feeling. You know, and this goes hand in hand with leadership, right? Because if you are competing with other countries, if you, you know, and if you're competing, you probably are putting some kind of importance on, on one of many illusions and saying, well, you know, we, we have to have a better economy. We have to have a dominant culture. We have to have whatever it is instead of letting it be natural. And the thing is, it's not saying that you shouldn't care if you lose in the competition. No, Lao Tzu is saying, don't compete. Then you won't have competition. You want these things, maybe economy and arts, just like I mentioned, you want these things to come naturally. You want it to grow organically, right? The wise do nothing and leave nothing undone. And now it's like, hey, don't compete and you won't have competition. And think about this, if you move, just to use an example, if you move to a city, right, and you're competing for, for a job, you're competing for education, you're competing even for healthcare, you're competing for whatever it is, you're competing for a higher salary, whatever it is, all these aspects of life, if you're competing in all those things, that's what people would call the rat race. You know, so this is the whole idea of you don't want to compete, but get this, you could have somebody in the exact same situation in a, in a busy hustle and bustle city like that, like New York City or something. And if they don't have that attitude of competition, their entire outlook is different. It's not a rat race anymore. You understand what I'm saying? Now there's a flip side is that if you use another example and say, you're a farmer with a hundred acres and you have nothing to compete for anyway. The only thing that you're actually dependent on is God. You're dependent on the weather. You're dependent on whether your crops are doing well. All you have to worry about is the force of nature growing your own crops. And of course, the sweat of your brow, you know, what the work that you have to put in. But you could have that same attitude anywhere, like in a big city where it is up to God and just the sweat of your brow, but you don't interpret it as a competitive thing. Now, do you understand what I'm saying here? Because in the example, the farmer, is not competing, but he is working hard. He has no competition. And you know, there's a million examples of this because because you could also say another flip side of it, you could have somebody like a farmer who has a hundred acres and he's farming, but he has a competitive mindset and he says, you know, well, you know, I need to get all these gains and we need to have this kind of harvest this year, even though most of it's not in his power. And then even though he has 100 acres, he's, he's comparing himself to his neighbors. He's keeping up with the Joneses. Do you see what I'm saying here? It's not like, because a lot of people will say that everybody should like, you know, buy 100 acres and all your problems will be solved. And to that, I say, you cannot run away from your own legs, okay? If you do not change your attitude in that way, you could go to Mars and you'll have the exact same problem where your feet stand. I know plenty of people who live in more rural areas and they have that same attitude. Like they, they, they want to wear better jewelry than other people at church. And it's like, yo, what is going on? What did you get away from the city from? You're, you're like bringing that same kind of competitive, weird culture. That whole thing can exist everywhere and anywhere, regardless of the country, regardless where you are. And this is another way to understand the point that, you know, I've said many times throughout this series, this is not about what you do. It is about how you are perceiving it. You can live in a, in a city like New York or LA and you could be a total stoic. That's the beauty of it. This is the beauty of the internal, putting faith in the internal instead of the external. Because when we compete and we have that inherently competitive attitude, whether we like it or not, a lot of our authenticity, our creativity, and even the quality of our work ethic actually drastically changes. Now understand something, right? The successes of others can, can fuel inspiration, okay? I'm not saying that you can't see things and see how other people are doing and maybe get ideas and try new things. I'm not talking about that, nor is Lao Tzu. This is about sacrificing our own authenticity and our own nature for something that is not real. I like to use the example of people who are trying to make it in a certain industry and instead of bringing their authentic selves, they're pretty much mimics. And it's really sad because it's like so many of them are so uniquely talented, but they go into this Confucianist kind of thing where it's like, oh, I have to be this way. 
you know? So you have like, you could have a hundred extremely authentic people with extremely original ideas, but in order to incorporate any of them, they have to chop down and put the circle in the square, square, the, what is it? The circle peg in the square hole, so to speak. And this is because our lives, a lot of the time, they're measured by the external world, by unrealistic measures of success, which are also are real. And you can look at everything, right? Home size, income, college acceptance. There's so many things, just to name a few. This is the competitive nature that we don't want at the forefront of our creativity, of our work ethic. Because like I said, you're not gonna be authentic. So you can do whatever it is you do, by the way. That's the, you should not take away that like, you have to switch up your whole life and move into the into the into the countryside, right? I mean, if the city's life life is not for you, then by all means. But but understand, you cannot run away from your own legs. But if you fix that internal, then you're good. Then you can breathe easy, because nothing externally can change that. Nothing can change that internal essence that you nourish and feed. And that's why that internal is so, so important.